So welcome everybody. This evening we have Danielle Teagan with us to give us a awesome preview into her Fargo Fire book um, of 1893. And I'll give you a quick intro of Danielle and then I'll really hand things over to her. She has um, a presentation and some questions and all of that for you guys to all listen in. And then I'll ask you just hang on to your questions until the end and then we'll have plenty of time to tackle those. Uh, especially as those of you that have already read it and those that are looking to read it, you can uh, chime in then. So this evening we have Danielle Teagan. She earned a bachelor's degree in journalism and management communications, as well as a master's degree in mass communication from NDSU. She has worked as a magazine editor for two local publications, as well as a senior communications strategist for an engineering firm in Fargo. She honed her public relations and marketing skills at the Chamber of Commerce before leaving to put her skills and experience to use the Fargo or Forum Communications in Fargo. In addition to writing the forum at the Forum of uh, Fargo Moorhead, Danielle has written for two local magazines, The Good Life, Lake and Home, um, or for a few local magazines, I should say, uh, Bison Illustrated from House to Home and The Wedding Vow. Her first book was The Hidden History of Fargo, which was published in 2017. And while this, her second book was released just in October of 2020. After living in Fargo for nearly 17 or 16 years, she recently moved back to South Dakota where she's with her husband and three children, and she continues to work remotely for Forum Communications as a content manager of a bi-monthly parent magazine. So, Danielle, let's jump in. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it, and thank you all for joining tonight. I hope you learn a little bit more about this very, very important event in Fargo's history, but I also hope you um, maybe just are a little bit entertained by uh, this preview of the book. Um, it's not a long book, but um, to condense it down into, you know, about 30, 35 minutes so that there's time for Q&A is a bit of a challenge. So um, I'm just going to give you a, a quick um, kind of set up to what was going on. So the, the book really does focus entirely on the Fargo fire of 1893. And if you're from Fargo, or if even you've been in Fargo for, you know, a number of years, you've probably heard about this event because it really was um, one of the most catastrophic events in the city's history, but it was also um, very important in a number of ways, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So to kind of understand how important the fire was to the history of the city, you have to really understand what was going on in the lead up to 1893. Fargo. Uh, this photo actually shows Fargo in 1878, and I picked this photo because it's actually the 500 block of Front Street, which we'll talk about later. That has some um, very important um, tie into the Fargo fire, but what you're looking at is um, Front Street. We know it is Main Avenue, but it was Front Street for many, many decades, actually, when Fargo first developed. And actually, by the time 1878 rolled around, Fargo had been around for a number of years as well, about seven years. Um, Fargo, like many, many cities in, um, you know, the upper Midwest, came about because of the Northern Pacific Railroad. And actually, um, in 1871, the railroad had uh, crossed over into Dakota Territory and started um, setting up its new kind of headquarters in the area. And this city, Fargo, developed around it um, in those same years. At the same time in that 1870s uh, time frame, there was actually um, a, a railroad company, or excuse me, a banking company, the Jay Cook Company, that had invested heavily in the railroad, um, and the Jay Cook Company went bankrupt in 1873, and because of that failure, all of the stocks that people had um, in the Northern Pacific Railway Company, they wanted to cash those out, but they couldn't get money for them because the company that was backing that had gone under. So instead they ended up with large tracts of land and that's how we got Bonanza farming. And so in 1878, Fargo um, was starting to really see the effects of Bonanza farming. There were people coming into, into the city um, and really starting to set up kind of um, their home in Fargo. And several, as you can see, several of these businesses were also just trying to make a go of it in 1878. Um, I think it's important to note too that even by 1878, there were several fires that had happened um, in this new, this new up and coming town that were um, pretty disastrous for the time, just given the the small scale and scope of Fargo at the time. And so um, right after the city was founded, there was a hotel built called the Headquarters Hotel. And maybe you've heard of this, um, but it was a hotel. It's actually, it was located, um, if you think of Fargo now, Fargo, uh, if you think of Main Avenue and Broadway, the Headquarters Hotel was built 
on the northwest side of the tracks that cross right on the north side of Main Avenue now. Um, the headquarters hotel was built in 1872. It was actually the offices for the Northern Pacific Railway Company. Lots of politicians, lots of people were coming through because it was the fanciest hotel in Fargo at the time. One of the few hotels at the time, but it was the biggest and the grandest. Uh, two years after it was built, it went up in flames. There was a fire started, uh, they believe it was in the kitchen. The whole building burnt down. And it was contained to that building, but it was pretty disastrous to have one of the main focal points of that early, you know, fledgling city to go up in flames. So the people rebuilt it, the Northern Pacific Railway Company, they rebuilt it. Um, but just a couple years later, there was another fire just across, actually, it was on Front Street, a few blocks from where the 1893 fire happened. But that fire in 18 uh, 78 or 76, excuse me, uh, that actually took out, I think, 12 businesses. Um, and that was kind of the impetus for the people who were living in, in Fargo at the time to really realize, okay, we maybe need something organized. And we were talking earlier before um, we officially got started about the Bucket Brigade. And that was actually one of the very first efforts for organized firefighting was literally to give volunteers buckets or have buckets available and have people throw water on a fire. That was why they were called Bucket Brigades. They eventually had carts that had buckets attached to them to try to get to a fire faster and make sure they had buckets. But that's kind of where the, the genesis of firefighting in Fargo sort of started was those two important fires in the 1870s. Um, they started talking about whether they should have maybe a firefighting company, whether, whether they should be organized and have some volunteer volunteers who were willing to say, yeah, I'm going to do this. So they actually set up, they had their first firefighting company created in November of 1877. So right before this photo was taken, um, the, the hards, they were called after the North Dakota um, hard wheat. And pioneer John Hager was actually their chief engineer. Um, and John Hager was one of the more important pioneers in the city's history too. One of the first settlers, um, he was actually, he settled uh, what is now West Fargo, but at the time they called it Hagertyville for him. Um, and so he was a very important um, figure and he was also a very great person to have in charge of this uh, firefighting company as well. So after they decide to set up this firefighting company, they realize, well, maybe we need a central fire station. We need a place to have these men come and be able to organize and have some equipment and things like that. So they actually built the central fire station is what it was known. Um, it was the only actual organized um, building for all of their firefighting uh, equipment at the time. And it was a couple of carts, hand-drawn carts at the time. They eventually added some um, horse-drawn carts. But the really interesting thing for me when I was looking at this, and I will tell you that this image that you see on the screen is the only image I can find of the central fire station. And it came from Palmer Fornes's history of the Fargo Fire Department. I'm not sure where he got it because it's not cited in his um, publication, which is in the libraries. Um, but this was the only image I could find, and it was built on the corner of NP and Robert Street, which is exactly where the Fargo Fire Department is located today. So when you're standing in front of the Fargo Fire Department, downtown Fargo, the main, the main building, um, you are looking at the same location that this central fire station was built in 1880. And I just, I got goosebumps the first time I realized that because I just think that little connection to Fargo's history is just really unique and really great. So they actually, you can see on the side of the photo too, there's a bell tower. That was their fire alarm bell. They added the bell in 1881. They waited for it to get sent to them. They installed it. They also had a fire alarm system um, installed throughout the city. They actually ended up replacing it. They installed the first one in 1881, but then they replaced it in 1884 with a more sophisticated version, um, which I was also quite delighted to find out that the alarm system that they had in place in the 1800s they did not remove that system until 1965. So that fire alarm system that they installed in the 1880s was still being, it was still, I don't know that it was being used, but it was at least those, those bell or those uh, alarm bells that were throughout town were in place in downtown Fargo until 1965, which I think is just wild. <laughs> so um, I found that out in Palmer Fornes' history of the fire department as well. Um, so he get they get this fire alarm system set up and the way that their bell system worked is that they had these alarm boxes throughout located at different places throughout Fargo and it was much much smaller obviously at the time um, but each bell had a certain number and they were all connected by overhead wires that they had and when there was a fire someone had to get into that alarm box ring the bell 
and whatever number it rang. So if it was like 63, it would ring six times and then three times there'd be in a, a very obvious pause. So they'd know where the fire was located or about the, the, the approximate location of the fire. And then it would send off that signal and they would know where to respond to. So that was very important in the effort to fight fires because then that kind of comes back to when we get to the actual day of the fire of 1893. In the meantime, there are two more firefighting companies established in Fargo, one of which is shown here in this photo, the Continental Hose Company. Um, and they were, they were, there was also a Xerxa firefighting company as well. And this photo might look a little weird because they're not actually getting ready to fight a fire. <laughs> These firefighting companies, there were 30 men in each company. So 90 men throughout Fargo were part of these different firefighting companies. And they ended up becoming sort of mini celebrities because they would then compete against other firefighting companies from the state and the region at these tournaments, basically. Their fire boys, so Fargo's fire boys, as they were called, um, would go up against Castleton firefighters or Grand Forks firefighters, and they would they would take part in these different activities. You can see they're pulling a they're pulling a hand drawn cart. That was an activity. Sometimes it was speed, so it was how quickly they could unroll a hose or how quickly they could foot race because you know being a firefighter is about speed and being able to respond to fires quickly. And so this was sort of um, a really big entertainment factor for these communities too because they really wanted their own fire boys to win these tournaments and kind of come back as like local celebrities and, and athletes basically um, when they won these different tournaments. And I will tell you the Continental Hose Company was the most decorated of all of those hose companies. Um, and this photo I think is just, I, I find it quite funny because at first glance their uniforms look a little bit odd but they are, if you can see, they do actually like button up to the neck and their full pants and stuff. So it took me a few times of looking at that photo to realize, I don't think they should be fighting fires in that, but it's okay. They, you know, they can do it for these athletic competitions that they took part in. Um, also, interestingly enough, um, by the time 1893 rolled around in June, the weekend after what would become the Great Fire, the, the city of Fargo was actually supposed to be um, hosting one of these major tournaments. The North Dakota Firemen's Association was holding its annual meeting in Fargo on June 10th and 11th. Um, and they were going to obviously have lots of different activities and those firefighting companies were gonna go head to head with some of these other neighboring ones. But we'll come back to that too when we get to the actual fateful day. So before we get to the actual day too, so leading up to there's, you know, all of this development, all of this um, infrastructure is put in place for fighting fires because they realized if we're going to be a thriving, growing city, we need to be able to fight a fire if it happens because it's going to happen. It already had. So what was happening though in the 1890s leading up to the fire was also important because um, in 1893, another railroad company had collapsed on the East Coast. Um, I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head, but because of that, Obviously, banks went under again, the stock market plummeted, and it set off a national recession. So on the East Coast, they were starting to feel the effects of unemployment. Um, lots of businesses were failing. All told, that recession um, would leave 4 million people unemployed, and it would result in 15,000 businesses failing over the course of just a couple of years. And by June of 1893, um, Fargo was starting to feel some of the effects of that national recession, um, but we'll come back to that too in just a minute. So the one bright spot of 1893, um, right before the fire happened, was that the world's uh, Columbian Exposition had just opened up in Chicago in May, and I thought it was really interesting that a couple of the forum newspaper front pages that I checked out leading up to the fire um, had some different articles talking about what was happening in Chicago with the World's Fair, what we know it as the World's Fair, and how um, the Ferris wheel had just been debuted and that President Grover Cleveland had actually um, electrified the entire Ferris wheel with these newfangled electric lights that no one had ever seen before. And so it was a little bit of a bright spot in that they could, you know, read about what was happening in Chicago. There's some exciting things happening, but um, didn't realize what was going to be coming just a few days later in June. So the day of the fire, it's Wednesday, June 7th, 1893. At that time, the census of uh, 1890 said there were about 6,000 people living in Fargo. So obviously much, much smaller than we know it now, but it had been growing steadily over, you know, each decade. And the day started pretty much as normal. What you're looking at on screen too is a Sanborn insurance map of the block 
where the fire started that day. So the morning starts, um, it ended up, it was June, it was in the Midwest and it was very hot. It got to 88 degrees that day and there was a gusting wind of about 30 miles per hour. It got a little bit higher than that at some different points according to the historical weather data. Um, it's important to know too that it was very, very dry, not just that day, but leading up to it. And this was one of the things that I really wanted to make sure to understand that I went, I took this historical weather data and I took it to, to John Wheeler, the meteorologist at WDAY and said, can you break this down for me? Can you, can you explain to me what was going on, you know, meteorologically, weather-wise, what was happening? And he looked at the precipitation and leading up to June 7th, there had been precipitation, I think we've counted it out from the end of April, it had been a really wet winter, but then all of a sudden come spring, there was just no precipitation. There I think had been two or three instances where it was just minor, minor precip. So he said, you know, you think about that topsoil is so dry, it's just whipping around everywhere, but everything was so, so dry. He said it was just brittle and basically it was all just tinder waiting to be, you know, um, up to go up in flames. And so I think that's really important for us to think about too, about how this fire could have started so quickly, but then also just raged so quickly as well, because everything was so dry. And you remember that photo from 1878, everything was wood, right? So all of these buildings that you see on this map, those all indicate a building. There were lots of businesses on this 500 block of Front Street, all made of wood. And you can see there's a star above kind of the middle of that block. That is that is delineating where Herzman's Dry Goods Store is. And that store is where the fire started that day. That afternoon was about 2.15. There are two different versions of how the fire started. Both of them are connected to the Herzman Dry Goods Store. And both of them are actually connected to a member of the Herzman family who was running that store. One version says it was the mother and owner of the store, Rosa Herzman, that she was burning some cardboard and the fire got out of hand at the back of the store and then just lit everything behind it in that alley. You can kind of see splitting that block. Um, and then it just took off from there. The other version is that her daughter, Lily, who also worked in that store, that she had thrown some ashes out the back door. And again, because of the wind, because it was so dry and everything was wood, it just took off. Those ashes had a few embers and that's all it took to basically start that whole back of the building on fire and then it just spread from there. And you can see there are some outlined stars as well and those indicate the other businesses on that block that were either destroyed or heavily damaged by the fire. And I just think that's really important for us to kind of see visually how that fire started in that one area, quickly spread, took out some of those buildings. Um, I was impressed to know that not all of the block was completely destroyed. So some of them did escape. Um, one of the more important businesses that actually played a pretty big role in the fire was, if you kind of look on the list of texts, if you can read it, there's a Schofield gunsmith located at 516. And that's just two doors down from 512, which is where Herzman's dry goods store was located. That gun shop had kegs of gunpowder. And what does gunpowder do when it's lit on fire? It explodes. And that explosion just um, literally added huge fuel to this fire that was already burning through these buildings pretty quickly. So this fire got out of hand very, very quickly and it spread pretty rapidly as well. I think that's important for us to consider too how, how disastrous and destructive this fire was because some of those really early unfortunate instances happened that sort of allowed it to get out of control so quickly. This fire, or this, excuse me, this photo is actually one of the most famous images from the fire of 1893 um, because it shows where the fire started. So right in the middle, you can see all of the smoke that's billowing. And then on what is the right side, um, you can see there's a hotel that's actually Crane's Hotel, which did not get destroyed in the fire. It got some scorching and some damage, but didn't get totally destroyed, which I think is fortunate for that restaurant. Um, but you can see this photo shows just how these, these men are rushing to try to stop this fire, but already you can see, you know, this this fire is going to get out of hand and get out of hand pretty quickly. Um, this fire was, or excuse me, this photo was taken by a man named O.E. Flayton. He was a Moorhead pioneer photographer. And thankfully he had an office in Moorhead and not Fargo because he was safe on the other side of the river, but he realized this is a pretty important event. We should probably document. And because he did, we now have 
all of these wonderful images of the fire um, that still exist today. And actually the, uh, excuse me, the Clay County Historical Society in Moorhead actually has all of his original plates and things in their collection. So um, you can see digitized images, but they also have the original plates that he made from all of these photos, which I think is just fantastic that they still exist and are being preserved. Um, and most of the photos that you'll see of the fire, the, the, the destruction are actually Flayton photos that he's taken and I only used probably a fraction of the photos even in the book because he just he was all over the city that day as it got out of hand. Um, so one thing also to keep in mind too is that this started on the south side of Front Street but because it started to grow so rapidly and it was windy it ended up jumping across the street so across Front Street to where there were a bunch of huge warehouses, these huge wooden warehouses, and they just, the fire just gobbled those businesses up, those warehouses up. And unfortunately, in a really terrible um, coincidence, there was actually a firefighting um, storage house. This hose house was actually across the street from where the fire started. And because the fire jumped across there so quickly, a lot of the firefighting equipment was lost because the fire just took out that building as well. Um, some other really terrible instances that really added to the confusion, um, helped really hinder the firefighting efforts is there was actually a firefighter on duty out with a hose cart with water already ready to go, but he was out sprinkling the streets because they were getting ready for this firemen's association meeting the next or this coming weekend. And he was watering down the streets because they were too dusty and they didn't want all that dust being kicked up. The business owners probably didn't want the dust in their businesses too. He was on the north end of Broadway though, and this all happened on the south end of Broadway on Front Street. And so he was on the opposite end of town at the time, realized what was going on, tried to get to the fire as quickly as possible, but again, lost some time, lost a little bit of you know um, firefighting effort there the fire alarm system that was in place. So you can, if you remember from the other map, I'll go back here really quickly if I can go back. So on the corner of 6th Street and Front Street, there was a building, uh, there's a business called the Sunberg's Jewelry Store. Um, and there was actually a fire alarm box in that store. So a volunteer firefighter named Wallace Rice sees what's happening and realizes, hey, we need to ring the alarm bell. Let's go into the jewelry store. So, because it's the closest alarm box to the fire. They couldn't find the key to open up the alarm box, so they couldn't ring the alarm. So while the clerk and while Wallace Rice are trying to find this, this key to open up the fire alarm box, they're losing valuable time to fight this fire. It ended up that the, a man named Sam, who was working at the waterworks plant station, which was um, on the south east side of Island Park at the time, he sees all this smoke and he's the one who rang the alarm, but because he was not located where the fire was and his alarm bell rang, caused some confusion with these different fire companies about where's this fire? I don't understand. The, the bell went off here, but we see smoke here. So fighting the fire became very hard just for those um, couple of instances of confusion and things that were happening. And so that really hindered the effort to try to stop this fire. And they really couldn't stop the fire. Um, this photo shows um, what happened in just a matter of hours, actually. So this started around 2.15 that day. And by seven o'clock, the fire had pretty much extinguished itself, but in the time that it had taken out all of these blocks. So what you're seeing actually is um, it's looking toward Broadway and this is where the central fire station was located, but this is all that remained of it at the end of those few hours. It took out two, what was it? Two, uh, 30 city blocks. So it raced after it went to Front Street, it ended up going up Broadway and took out 30 city blocks all total. There were 210 businesses that were destroyed in this fire. Um, the fire station wasn't included as a business, but you can see this is the fire alarm bell on the left side of the photo. That is the bell that was supposed to be in the tower to let people know this is where the fire was. And instead it's laying in a pile of rubble. And you can see in the kind of the middle of the photo, it's a hand-drawn hose cart that's been completely destroyed. You can see a little bit of hose in the front too. And I just think when I saw this photo, uh, I just thought it's so sad. And it looks like that little boy on the photo on the edge of the photo too, looks so forlorn and just really defeated. I think this photo is just really indicative of the destruction that this fire really waged on the city. Um, there were 210 businesses. Like I said, I was surprised when I when I kind of added up too, there were 140 residences that were lost too. And when I saw that number, I thought, 
well, that doesn't make any sense because that's a business district of town. But at the time, these wooden buildings were two-story frame buildings. And most of the people who had businesses on the, on the bottom level, the first main level, also then lived in the second floor of their building too. So if they were doctors, if they were insurance agents, if they were lawyers, um, when I cross-referenced their name, the owner's name to their residence, their business and their residence was completely lost in this fire. So it left 2,000 people homeless, which was a third of the city. You think about all of those people, you know, after this fire finally rages and finally extinguishes itself, um, 2,000 people were left without a home. It ended up, the fire took out six and a half miles of wooden sidewalk throughout the city. Um, it took out 150 miles of telephone poles, all of it just gone in a matter of hours. Um, and I just think that it's, it's just so sad to think about how those people must have felt when this is what they saw at the end of these few hours. You know, this photo was taken actually, it was looking over Northwest over Broadway and it was taken from Front Street, but a few blocks from where the fire started. Um, you can see the ruins are smoking. You can see, it's just so much of the city is leveled and that's really what it did, um, destroyed so much. By seven o'clock that night, people had started, all these people who were homeless and tried to had tried to gather their belongings or anything out of their businesses, they didn't have anywhere to go. So they ended up congregating in Island Park. Um, and one of the descriptions I read in the newspaper said that it was a night of despair and there were women and children wailing. Um, there were actually some thieving and some, some looting happening at these different businesses. And I just thought, that must have just been just devastating for all of those people who just didn't know what they were going to do with themselves. They didn't know if their businesses would, you know, come back from this, if they would have a home again. Um, it was just really, when I tried to really think about that after reading all of these descriptions of the fire, thinking about Island Park, beautiful Island Park, thinking about it being full of these people who had lost businesses or lost their homes. There were stories that people had taken baby carriages or any wagon or anything they could basically to load some belongings onto and get it out of the fire's way. They were wandering around with these things going, well, this is all we have left in the world because everything else was destroyed by this fire. And I just think that night in Fargo must have been like, unlike any other the city has seen, but the city was not going to be defeated. And I think that's really, really fantastic. The next day, the city council met to talk about what they could do to make sure that this didn't happen, what they could do to help rebuild um, in terms of the city and the infrastructure that was lost. Um, business owners said they came back the next day. Alex Stern, whose clothing store was lost in the fire, he said, nope, I am not going to be defeated by this. I'm going to come back. I'm going to rebuild my store. I'm going to put 100 men to work right away. I'm going to get bricks. I'm going to get anything I can find to build this better and bigger than it was before. And he did. And many, many business owners did that same thing. They said, nope, we are not going to be defeated by this. There were $3 million in losses because of that fire, but because of the insurance that they had on their bus businesses, um, $1.2 million flooded into the city of Fargo in 1893. That was an astronomical sum, but it saved the city from the recession because Fargo was one of the only cities in the upper Midwest that had jobs, had, you know, work available for people to come and put themselves to work because of this fire. So it actually, you know, one of the things that people reflected on later was, wow, this fire was devastating, no doubt, but it really turned into a blessing because it kept people at work. We ended up coming coming back better and stronger. Um, the, the civic improvements that were put in place after the fire was were actually very important too. Um, they, the city council burned or they banned wooden sidewalks. They said, nope, we're not gonna have that anymore because we really think that that probably added fuel to the fire, literally. Um, they said that we're gonna have building ordinances or building inspection ordinances after this before they hadn't. And they wondered, well, maybe some of these dilapidated buildings probably could have been shorn up or they could have been either taken down you know, and rebuilt, whatever it was, they realized that was something they needed to do. They no longer had firefighters having anything to do with sprinkling city streets. You know, if they were too dusty, they said, "Nope, we're going to put to we're going to put together a specific um, committee that will take care of that." And they're not going to be firefighters. They actually upgraded the sewer system. They had a new pumping station put in place, and they connected that pumping station, a water pumping station, 
to the fire alarm system. So as soon as a fire alarm rang, this system started building up pressure. So when they needed to hook up, a, you know, some kind of hose to a water supply, they had it ready to go. So just things like that, that, you know, we don't think of necessarily now because we just take a lot of our, you know, technology for granted. But in 1893, they really were trying to think, what are some of these things we can do to make Fargo so much better and so much stronger because of this? Um, the Firemen Association meeting actually still happened in Fargo. It was a much different tone, obviously. They didn't have the activities. They didn't have um, all of the celebrations. And actually, the only death that's associated with the Fargo fire of 1893 was a firefighter named William Johnson. Um, he didn't die on the day of the fire, but he did he sustained some injuries and he succumbed to those injuries two days later and they actually had his funeral during this firemen's association and so they had um you know these these fire companies from fargo and all over the state actually um processed with him and his body from uh, where they were having the meeting to the catholic church where they ended up having his funeral and then they took him all the way to his grave site too so um, i have to imagine that was a very um somber event for all of those firefighters. Um, but this photo is showing 80 days after the fire. This is the kind of rebuilding that was happening just 80 days after the fire. And I just think um, this is really a testament to the perseverance of those business leaders, um, the dedication that they felt to the community of Fargo to say, you know what, we're not going to up and leave. Yes, our, our business may have gone up in smoke, literally, but we are not going to leave. We are going to come back bigger and stronger. And they did. Um, it, within that first year, actually, there were 246 buildings erected um, for about a million dollars. So that's all in the community, all this money that's being, um, you know, flooded into the city of Fargo. Two short years after the fire of 1893, this is what Broadway looked like. You would never know that there had been a catastrophic fire just two years prior to this because the city had rebuilt and look at these beautiful brick buildings that many of which actually still grace downtown Fargo. Um, some of the first buildings that were built after the fire um, was the Hodo building. So it was originally the International um, Fellow uh, International Order of the Odd Fellows building. They built that right away after the fire in 1894, just across the street from it. So they're just, if you kind of see, it's a couple blocks up. Um, but across the street from the Hodo building is what we know as the Royal Block, but it actually was the O'Neill Block when it was put up in 1894. It was um, erected by a businessman named Harry O'Neill. And that has changed. The facade has changed a lot. I saw some historical photos. Um, it doesn't look like, it didn't look like what it does now, but that building, the, the, bones of it uh, were erected in 1894 and it's still in downtown Fargo, a very important figure in downtown Fargo as well. So um, I really thought that was important too, to um, make sure people knew how many buildings still stand. Alex Stern's building that he rebuilt still stands on the corner. Um, then actually too, there was um, a fire festival that was started in 1899 and they weren't having it all the way up until the centennial. They sort of lost some steam um, through the mid century, mid uh, 20th century. But on the centennial of the fire of 1893, the city of Fargo dedicated this monument and it's located in front of the Bank of the West building um, on what was believed the location of the Herzman Dry Goods Store on obviously we know it as Main Avenue, it was Front Street at the time, but um, during that centennial celebration, they actually reenacted the fire with Herzman's Dry Goods Store. Um, I believe it was the Argus building and then another, I can't think of the third building, um, they erected you know, fake storefronts and then lit them on fire. They had many, many, many firefighters on hand in case something happened, um, but it was a really big celebration for the community too, to come together and say, look at what we've done and what we've accomplished since this fire happened, you know, 100 years ago. And so there was a big celebration. Um, there was a lot happening in the time too. And, and really, when I thought too about what had happened since the fire of 1893, that fire was one of the first really major catastrophic natural disasters to hit Fargo. Um, but like those other natural disasters, like the flood of 1897 or the tornado in 1957 and all of the floods in the, you know, 1997 and the 2000s, you know, all of those events, including the fire were really devastating for the community, but the community wouldn't be defeated by that. And I just think that that's, again, it's a true testament to the perseverance of everyone who was living in Fargo at the time. Um, the community itself, the business community who just, you know, everyone banded together and said, nope, we're, we're not going to be defeated by this. We are going to come back stronger and better each time. And they did. 
So two, I want to make sure we leave some time for questions and answers too, but I did want to mention um, the human aspect of the fire and in some of those stories, that was probably the most fun part. And I didn't cover a lot of the human stories in this presentation, just because um, they're sort of scattered throughout the book in terms of how these people were affected by the fire or their experiences with the fire, but that's all in the book too. Um, but I do want to mention the Herzman family because they are obviously integrally tied to the fire of 1893 because they are blamed for the start of the fire. Um, and I think that it's important to recognize that this was a family. They came from Austria. That's where their family was from. Um, they immigrated. This is a picture. If you see on the left side, um, it's a picture of Elkin and Rosa Herzman. They were the um, matriarch and patriarch, excuse me, of the family. They came from Austria. They ended up meeting in New York City. Uh, they got married in 1863. And Elkin actually was a rabbi. But he had some interesting experiences as a rabbi that I cover in the book. Um, he bounced around to a few different places. He ended up in Chicago, actually, in 1871. He, it was after the fire happened there, so he wasn't around then. Um, but they ended up, instead of him just being a rabbi, they ended up establishing a dry goods store. Um, they started in Brooklyn in 1865 that Rosa was actually running, and that's pretty unheard of for the time for the for the woman of the family to be running this dry goods business, but she did. And they ended up after they were in New York City and in Brooklyn, they ended up going to Council Bluffs, Iowa in 1874, I believe it was. Um, and they were there for a number of years. And actually, I, I found some photos or I, I was sent some photos of where their store was in Council Bluffs by some of the Herzman descendants. And I just think that's also a really cool tie to know that that block, their business, the building obviously doesn't exist anymore, but um, they know where the business was located. And by 1885, the family, for whatever reason, we don't know, decided to uproot itself. By then they had several children. I believe at the time they had five of their seven children. They decided to come to Dakota Territory and they settled in Fargo, established a dry goods business. And by all accounts, they were pretty successful um, and very well-liked in the community. Um, their business was described as being a good, well-run business, successful, offered lots of different things. Um, so when this fire happened, I was under the impression, or I was under the assumption, I should say, that maybe they got run out of town because if they were associated with the start of the fire, maybe people were really upset about that. And that's not the case, actually. Elkin himself was actually one of the business owners who the next day said, nope, uh, we're going to rebuild. We're going to come back. We're going to have our store here. We're going to do this. Um, and they did start rebuilding, but it ended up that there were several lawsuits filed against mostly Rosa herself, a couple against her daughter, um, because they, these different businesses were alleging that Rosa was trying to rebuild her store with either credit um, she didn't have or supplies she never paid for. So there's just a slew of these lawsuits and several of them were settled. Some of them, I couldn't really gauge whether they'd been settled, um, but it was a, I'm guessing it was a pretty rocky time for the family. And by 1900, they stuck around for a few years, but by 1900, um, the family had ended up back in New York City. Some of the kids scattered as they got married and established their own families. And New York City is actually um, where Elkin died. He died in 1916 and Rosa died in 1919. But I ended up working back and I found um, a couple of descendants of theirs who's actually, they're the descendants of their um, youngest grandchild, um, their grandson. And it was really interesting to talk to these descendants because they didn't know anything about the Fargo fire of 1893. They knew their family had been in Fargo for a time, but they didn't know much. And they certainly didn't know that their family had been associated with a pretty catastrophic event, like a fire in the city. Um, and I thought it was also especially telling that this, these siblings that I found, their names are Bill and Susan Blout, um, they actually, their father was named Elkin Blout, and they didn't know that their father, Elkin, had been named for his great-grandfather, Elkin Herzman. So when I explained who I was and who I was researching and their connection and how I'd worked back, uh, I remember Bill saying to me on the phone, oh my gosh, I didn't know that my father was ever named for anyone in his family because he never talked about it. And actually, this image of Elkin and Rosa, it's not in the book because um, I couldn't verify it and this was too low of a too low quality because it's actually a screen grab of a video of their father Elkin Blout who at one point and I believe it was like the early 90s he had he had a family photo album 
of all of these different photos and different pictures and newspaper articles um, that someone had stashed away, but they found the video of him talking about this photo album and stuff. And they sent me the video and I got this screen grab, but it was, it was much too low quality to actually print in the book. There's certain requirements for the images in the book, but I did want to include it here because this is the only image I've ever seen of Elkin and Rosa Herzman this image from this video. So um, this felt like a really, really important find that unfortunately I couldn't put in the book, but now I'm trying to include it in the presentation. So at least people can see, you know, who these are. And then on the other side, two of the, of the photo is um, the Herzman store after it was rebuilt. And they, I got this from another um, Herzman descendant. Um, his name was Tanner. And they're the ones who added the yellow outline to make sure that people knew which building was the Herzman dry goods store after it was rebuilt. Um, but this one is included in the, in the book too. So, I just want to make sure that everyone um, has a few minutes in case we have some some questions out there. Um, this was again just a very quick overview of the book. Um, so if you're interested, I hope you'd be you know so kind to see either check out the book from the library. I know that the West Fargo Library is getting that. I think the Fargo Library has it, but then it's also the book is also available in Fargo as well. So if you're at bookstores or you want to order it online, you can do that as well. But um, I did leave some time. I would love to answer um, any questions that anyone might have. Um, about either the book or the process or anything else. You guys all can unmute yourself. So if you have a question, um, Eileen, I see you, you, you're ready. Yeah, I have a question about um, how do you spell the, the grand, the relative's last name? Is it Blout? Yep, B-L-O-U-T. Okay. Yeah, and um, this Elkin Blout, a uh, crazy story about him that he had quite the career. He actually helped, he was a chemistry uh, professor at one point. He studied chemistry in college, became a professor, and he helped develop Polaroid film. So the reason we have Polaroid cameras is because of this Herzman family descendant who did this crazy chemistry experiment and allowed us to have Polaroid film and Polaroid cameras. And that's how their family actually became pretty wealthy because he was smart enough to invest in the company when he started working there. And then they developed this crazy technology and there's cameras and boom, he ends up with a financial windfall because of it. So now we have cameras in our phones. So, right. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Frank, did you have a question? I thought I did and I, and I lost it now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we'll keep talking if you think of it. Oh, there's something in the chat. Did we look at that? Someone asked any more books in the works. Um, not currently in the works. No, um, I've gotten this question a few times. I, I think any writer always has ideas in their head about what they want to write next or what they want to tackle next. So I have some ideas, but um, right now I'm just trying to actually focus on this and kind of getting the word out. It's been interesting to publish a book during a pandemic. And also when you don't live in Fargo anymore, which I'm hoping to get up to Fargo to do, I really like these talks in person because it's a lot of fun. This is great too when you can't be in person. So I appreciate everyone being here. But um, yeah, it's been an interesting process getting this book and kind of talking about it. But we'll see what happens next if there are any other books that get started. Danielle, I remembered my, my question. Where in South Dakota do you live now? So I live near Aberdeen, South Dakota. It's actually my hometown. It's a really small hometown. Um, Turton is the name of my hometown. I graduated from Doland um, and we live near Aberdeen. So it's kind of a roundabout way of describing it, but we're in the Northeast corner. If you kind of know where Aberdeen is, that's where we are. That's a beautiful area. It is, it very much is. I mean, so is, you know, North Dakota too, but yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a nice area up here. Lots of green, um, lots of fields in the summer too. So it's really nice. On a historical note, I collect Red Wing and I have a Turton, South Dakota bean pot, an advertising oh my gosh. bean pot that was, that was made, you know, to give away at Christmas to customers. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a crazy connection. Most people have <laughs> never, ever heard of Turton. That's, uh, that's why I have. I, I thought of that right away. I know I've got one of those. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's crazy. Awesome. How long have you had it? Oh, I don't know, 10, 15 years. I'm an active Red Wing uh, collector, okay. so, but I've had that one for quite a while. Wow, small world, very small. 
<laughs> well, just know that, you know, if you're ever around an antique show or something, you might find it if you want right? a, a historical souvenir. Exactly. And everyone loves those too. Yes. Yeah. When, uh, when I found out about this, uh, what's going on tonight, this book review, uh, uh, my wife wound up going to Barnes and Noble and they had a lot of these books there on the Fargo Fire of 1893. Good. I think, yeah, they have it in there. Right away. If she brought it home, she said, here it is. You can get ready. <laughs> oh, good. Well, have you started, have you started reading it? Oh, I read the whole thing. It was very interesting. Nice. Good. Well, I'm glad. So yeah, you know a lot more about it than I was even able to cover here too. So um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and learned something too. That was one of the biggest compliments I received after I'd written the first book about uh, the hidden history of Fargo, which is lots of just different stories about kind of lesser known people, places, things associated with Fargo. And um, that was one of the best compliments I received was someone who said to me, you know, I've lived in Fargo my whole life and I didn't know most of this stuff. I learned so much. And I said, well, good, that, that's what, that's what any writer wants to do. You either want to entertain or you want to inform people. And that's what I hope people get from either this book or that one too, is that they learn something. Oh, and someone has a signed copy from Zanbros. Yes. Greg emailed me, I think back in December and said, Hey, if you're in town, you can stop by and sign some more books for me. I'd love to. So when I get back up there, hopefully in the next couple of months, I have to stop by and sign some more copies just so that people can have a signed copy. I do. If anyone hasn't purchased a copy of the book, um, and would like a signed copy, if you can't get to Zambros, um, I do have copies too that I can, I can send, I can mail to people, um, and I can autograph it, you know, personally to you, or just leave it signed as it is right now, but um, I can certainly help out with that too. And, and Kristen has my contact information if anyone would want to Absolutely. touch with me. Well, I, I downloaded mine to Kindle, so I've got a Kindle, so it's hard okay. to sign that. So I'll probably have to get a hard, hard copy. <laughs> well, sometime, yeah, if you want to have both versions, you know, it's sometimes, sometimes it's nice to have the digital version, but sometimes it's nice to have a paper version too. Yeah, I like both. Hardbacks, yeah. Frank, did you have another question? Oh, nope, I just saw him pop in. You know, Danielle, you know, you've got pictures, you know, like from um, the uh, Clay County Historical Society and the yeah. NDSU and the Fargo Forum. Yeah. You, when you publish those, do you have to pay for those? To so I didn't, I didn't have to pay for the forum ones because my, as my employer, they said, you can use what you need as long as you give proper credit, basically, is what they said. Um, but because so many of these fire photos are also, they exist in so many different areas that I wanted to make sure that I use some from every entity that I could. Mm -hmm. So that's why, yeah, there are some from the Clay County Historical <coughs> Society, and there are some from the NDSU archives. And those I did have to pay for. That's just um, part of the usage. And you have to use, uh, you use you pay for publication rights and then for also the digitization, they have a, a fee for the digitization of it too, just to make sure that um, they can obviously stay solvent as businesses as well. But um, yep, that's part of the process is just making sure you have the rights to be able to use those photos. So when you, so you just paid for the one, like from Clay County, you paid yep, for so I. Yep. So I picked the ones from the Clay County Historical Society that I wanted to use. I picked the ones from the NDSU archives that I wanted to use and paid for those. And then we had a few, obviously, from the forum, too. We actually, I think we had every single one. The forum had every single one, but I also wasn't sure about which ones were maybe original or the best quality digitizations of the photo. So that was also part of the process of, okay, well, the Clay County ones, I assumed, were probably the best quality, but then the historical, or excuse me, the NDSU archives had some that either were a different kind of angle or they'd been, they'd been digitized a little differently. So the coloring was a little different. And then I thought some of ours at the forum too, were maybe a little bit, like, I think they were a copy of a copy possibly. So I was trying to avoid using those if I could. So yeah. it was kind of a little bit of guesswork. And so that's why I tried to use some from every entity basically to just to make sure everyone got a little bit of credit here and there. Yeah. <laughs> <Around the basis. laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is Frank. I'm trying to understand. No, uh, the the other lady Kate comes on, and then I see her picture in the middle of my screen. But when I come on, I don't. I just got. I just see my Frank L on there. 
And okay. I wonder if I enter, if you entered the meeting some different way than I did, that 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 I can see you when you talk. I think sometimes there is an option to enter a meeting either with video on or video off right away at the beginning. So that could be the difference. And I've okay. got mine. I've yeah. got mine. Yeah, I've got mine with, you know, when you when you're in Zoom, you can choose that you can put a profile picture. Yes. So and that's I why that shows up. Yeah. I think it's because it's a webinar because I do a lot of Zoom meetings and this one you entered very differently. Yes, it was different for me too because we do do a lot of Zoom meetings, our senior group. Yeah. So. Nice. I have one question for you, Danielle. I guess, so a little bit of this is the sort of genealogical research and that historical research. What was the most difficult component for you to find about this specific event? Or, and then as you wrote the book, like what component of that was most challenging? I think the hardest part for me was that this fire has been written about by so many different people in so many different sources, but nothing had ever been put into one place. So I had to try to find all of those different descriptions or, um, you know, any kind of information I could. And then once I assembled everything, I had to figure out, okay, well, what is probably the most factual? Because some of the versions, you know, as you got further removed from 1893, some of the versions were a little bit different or they described things a little differently or they, they talked about some of the conditions differently. And so that was part of why I really thought it was important to either go back to like historical weather data, to go back to um, addresses, like actual physical addresses to kind of just know, okay, is this how it went? And is this where the fire was? And um, it was really sort of, kind of investigating, yeah, what was what was the true, you know, event, what actually happened, what were the circumstances, what were the actual conditions that were happening at that exact time. Um, and probably still, you know, there might have been some things missed, but there were some articles that had some really interesting things, but I hadn't seen those descriptions anywhere else. And so I didn't feel comfortable using those or I had to say like this, you know, this wasn't included anywhere else. And just, um, you know, having some of that information verifiable or at least corroborated with some different sources or at least going back to the people who said that, would they have actually been there, you know? And um, so it was really kind of making sure that I could verify the facts of what I was including in the book um, with the sources I had available and, and primary sources too. That was something that um, there aren't a lot of primary sources that exist obviously still, but um, there were a couple that were really helpful in just describing that or people who described what they saw. Like one of them was John Hanaher, who was interviewed by um, Steve Hubbard from the Fargo Library. He interviewed him back, I think when he was in college. And at the time, John Hanaher was 13 when the fire happened and Steve sat down and interviewed him and said, you know, what do you remember? And what do you just, what, do, what was it like? And so he sat down and kind of described all of this. And that was really helpful too then to go, okay, well, this description says this, and he said this. So it was nice to have at least some of a primary source available. I mean, he was interviewed, you know, several decades after the fire, but at least he was there on the actual day of the fire. So I think that was important. Um, and then like, as far as the genealogical research too, um, ancestry.com is the best thing for any of that, because honestly, just having census records, being able to watch where people go and kind of following back to those individuals and making sure I could see, okay, well, it said that their business, you know, a business directory said this in this year, but it said this in a census. So where did they go? Kind of what happened and where did some of those discrepancies happen to make sure again, that I was, I was including pretty verifiable information, but yeah, census records, ancestry, birth, I mean, birth and death records too are just really helpful to know when people lived and died and where they lived and died too. Just being able to kind of corroborate all of that and connect all of the dots between where they were, where they were, you know, doing business, when they lived, when they died, where they were buried, that kind of stuff. It's really <laughs> seems morose, but it really is helpful to have some of that really concrete information that you can kind of just pin your hat on and say, yep, this is what people were doing at the time. Especially when you're tapping into that Herzman family line, like being able to actually nail down people that are from that yeah. whole line of family. Wow, that's yeah. um, awesome. Well, and, and honestly, finding, reaching out to this Bill Blout and his sister, I felt like, I'm not going to lie, I felt like an internet troll because I was yeah, like, super creepy. <laughs> people trying to find an email address, trying to find a phone number, anything. I ended up emailing Bill at 
at, he was, um, he was like a financial officer for a church in Massachusetts. And I found there, I found his email address and was like, you're going to think I'm some creeper. I'm a spammer or something. I don't know. Um, thankfully he did get the email and we ended up having a really nice back and forth. And then we had a phone call and he put his sister, he got me tied in with his sister. So we had a really nice chat. Um, and then he put me in contact actually with some of his, um, like kind of extended family cousins who'd done a lot of genealogical research too. So they ended up sending me a bunch of stuff that then I could also corroborate with, okay, I'd found this. Okay. It says, yep, these people were here. And so, oh my gosh, they were, they were just wildly helpful too. Um, I was so happy. I sent, I sent Bill a copy of the book after it published just as a thank you to say, Hey, your family obviously was now super helpful with getting this book, you know, kind of off the ground with that Herzman chapter. So I sent him a book and I hope he's read it and enjoyed it. Daniel, your, your, uh, information you got from Palmer Fortness's reading. Uh, yes. That must have been quite helpful. You know, he used to play Santa Claus all the time here in yeah. Fargo and West Fargo. And he sat in the Hardy's restaurant for hours on end writing. He would, and he loved history, old things. Oh, yeah. yeah. He he was amazingly helpful in terms of what he'd written. And none of his stuff was officially published as a book, but right. manuscripts are available at the libraries. And actually, I worked with Palmer's son, John, um, years and years ago and yeah it's just kind of these crazy connections and then yeah when Palmer died a few years back you know it was it was really sad because the community did lose a really important figure you know he was really important at Bonanzaville in you know helping with the log cabin restoration there um he sat on their board for several decades I think he was um he was just yeah he was a fantastic historian and thank goodness he did because he was doing some of that at a time when not a lot of people were capturing some of that information too and actually I read his you know, it was unpublished manuscript, but it was his um, description of the fire is called the Red Tongued Monster. Um, and it's part of his fire department research too. But um, his description of the fire and kind of what he imagined it to be was really, it was really powerful. And I think that his research into the fire department really kind of added to that as well. So yeah, Palmer's stuff was great. And I, I hope his family knows that I love his stuff and that it was just wildly helpful too. You know, they're such a unique family. The the sons one year on for Palmer's birthday, they did a bunch of they had gravel hauled up there and, and things done at the farm where they had a separate cabin where they had a lot of old things, almost like a museum on their farmstead. Really? North, northwest of West Fargo. And the, these two sons, uh, and our comp my company was a gravel road building company and stuff, and they hired us them out there to bring Palmer his his birthday present that year. And it was just, I got to feel such a love for the whole family because it seemed they, there was such a uh, relationship and love between those, the, the whole family, the son right. and Palmer and, and the community and the, and the history of the region. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, that is absolutely true of the family. And yeah, I remember John talking about his dad too. And um, I reached out to him, you know, after his dad died too, and just was like, wow, I, I never met your dad, but I, I just, yeah, I really felt the love too, just through everything that was written about Palmer and talked about him and then the way his family talked about him too. I have a, a question, a, a geographical question. Yep. Um, I've always thought the two little wooden frame buildings that are on the intersection of 8th Street and Main Avenue, to me, they look like they would have been the era of the fire because they're wood frame. Were they survivors or were they, did it get as far as 8th Street or did it stay east of 8th? It stayed east of 8th, yep. So anything that's on that built on that block that was built in the time, you know, before the fire, if it's still there, it's still a structure. So the only building I know for sure that was built prior to the fire of 1893 uh -huh. still on that block is the Masonic building that is where the Dakota Business College was. Yeah, um, okay. The Masons built that in 1888, and that obviously survived the fire um, because, yeah, the fire didn't actually get that far west. It pretty much stayed on Broadway. It went a little bit, you know, because NP and Roberts is obviously um, just about a block off, a, a yeah. block, about a block west off of Broadway, but it didn't get much further than that because there were actually some giant warehouses a little bit further west um, that didn't get touched either. So it, it didn't get quite that far. So if there's something on that block that was pre-fire that's still there, it would certainly be a, a survivor, you know. Okay, uh, the, the, there's two 
stores there that are very much the old wood frame. Yep. I mean, they were ancient when I was in college and that's decades ago, so. Yeah, and I, I have to imagine if there's still wood frame buildings that they're probably not pre-1893, just given that the wood probably wouldn't have stood up. If okay. like the, the Dakota Business College building is made of brick. It's made yes. Of, so that's certainly a survivor, but those could have also probably been done maybe during the urban renewal, you know, process during the, you know, 1950s, 1960s. I know a lot of really old buildings in downtown Fargo were taken down and replaced with other buildings. Oh. So that could be where they could be, you know, that old, but probably not pre-1893 fire. Okay. I'll have to wander in and and look at them someday. One of them was a hippie shop when I was in college. Oh, okay. <laughs> there are a lot of cool buildings in downtown Fargo. <laughs> Stories that of all Dakota, of that. that Dakota College building was, was being built by the Masons. It wouldn't have been built of wood. Right. Nope. It was made of stone. And actually, the crazy thing I talk about this in the in the book. So Frank, you might recall this too. But the Masons, the the Shiloh Lodge that was um, that had built that building, they weren't even actually meeting in their building at the time of the fire of eighteen ninety three. They were meeting in a different building that did get destroyed by the fire. So if they had no. remained in the building that they built their building would have been fine. And instead, um, the Masons lost this grand library that they've been collecting oh, no. all of this information and all of these books and everything. And they lost it all in the fire. And so there was a really important librarian from the Masons, um, Frank Thompson, who then had to start building back this collection. And they ended up that collection, I believe, is now with the NDSU archives that he built back after the fire. But yeah, a lot of, lot of really important records. The fire department lost all their records. A lot of the city records were lost too because some of the city offices were in the basement of that central fire station even, or not the basement, the first level. So there were a lot of records lost in the 1893 fire, which you know is really sad to think about the history that was lost in there as well. Well, it was interesting to read in the book about the, the city passing the ordinance on the cement sidewalks. Because mm -hmm. uh, I could just see if the, you explained how dry it was, uh, the fire racing down those wooden sidewalks. You know, right. so That would have been true, like 10 to 10 or two of those. Well, and there was a lot of discussion too in the city council minutes about how um, those, those sidewalks probably also, um, what's the right word? They like, kind of um, what's, I'm trying to think of the right word, but they, they added to the fire because these flames got up under the sidewalks too. So they didn't yeah. necessarily burn on top, but they got under and then they led to all of these different buildings. So they think that's part of how quickly the fire spread too, is that those were just kind of like outlets to these different blocks and, you know, leading this fire to more destruction basically. And, and sort of, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of the right word. It's not coming to me right now, but yeah, it was really interesting how they said, Nope, we don't want those anymore. We we can't have wooden sidewalks. And it was interesting that the city did say they could have some temporary wooden buildings during the rebuilding phase. So the fire happened in June and they said, okay, if businesses need to put up some kind of, you know, just something either during the rebuilding phase or what, but they said those buildings had to be down by September 1st because they didn't want to take any chances with any more wood. So they said, you know, in this first interim process, we'll let you have a wooden building if you need it while you're actually building something more sturdy, but it's gotta be gone by September 1st because we don't want it. We don't want it here. <laughs> so they took them down. <laughs> They're on the line. Going right, yep. Those wooden sidewalks for a moment, they would have acted just like pipe or conduits. Right, <laughs> yes, that's, fire. yes. That they just, yeah, led to it and really didn't help things. Um, there's a really interesting picture in the book too, I didn't include in the presentation, but shows all of the people who flooded Fargo um, to look at the destruction basically in the weeks after the fire. And they're walking on one of the last remaining wooden sidewalks in town. And I just, I remember seeing that photo thinking, oh, someone needs to take that down really. <laughs> That's not safe. That is not the fire code. <laughs> right? Yeah, not good. One thing that was really, uh, I appreciated how there was a special train form that brought equipment from the West to help yeah, the Castleton, I think, and the fire departments came in. Yeah, uh, the banding together, you know, that's been a common denominator for this area yep. in emergencies. How we yeah. help each other, you know, even at Grand Forks back and forth during yep. the floods of '79. Yeah, I I think so too, Frank. That the the outpouring of support and encouragement from, you know 
obviously surrounding tones, but also, you know, there were messages and missives being sent from Minneapolis, from Aberdeen, from Sioux Falls, from Mitchell, South Dakota, all over the area saying, Fargo, you can, you can come back. You will not be, you know, defeated by this. And I just think that, yeah, really is, encouraging, you know, um, James Hill, who was the great Northern railway magnet, who just owned, you know, that railway, com railway company and lots of land and had tons of money. He owned the grand Pacific hotel in Moorhead at the time. And he immediately opened it up and said, anybody who is homeless because of the fire can come stay at my hotel for free. I, you shouldn't have to worry about a place to stay. You can stay here. Um, Livingston Lord at um, the Moorhead Normal College, which is now MSUM, he did the same for some of their outbuildings and said, hey, these buildings aren't being used. Please come. If you have lost something in the fire, you can stay here. And I just think, yeah, that, that sort of banding together and that sense of community spread even just beyond Fargo, it went, you know, even out further than that so james j hill had an interest in the np railroad too he was quite he truly was an empire builder oh absolutely yes and his and his influence not just in fargo but the whole midwest was just it's just boundless really yeah he uh he, you know uh, i'm a retired railroad worker oh really yeah and i had I, part of my pension was uh, a jim hill pension he set okay. up a pension for some of the great Northern guys way back when. I think wow. I got about $75 in my retirement was from that James J. Hill pension. Huh. He was quite a progressive man. He, he accomplished a lot of things and put a lot of difficult things together in this area. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and um, it's on my bucket list still that I want to get down to St. Paul to Summit Avenue um, and see his his mansion that's still standing because it's now been preserved and it's now you can get a historic tour through the James J. Hill mansion on seven summit Avenue. And I told, I found that out when I was researching my first book and I told my husband, you know, what was it five years ago? when I started researching that. I said, Oh my gosh, we have to go see that. Go. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't yet someday. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Danielle. This has been eye opening for me. I'm not from the Fargo area. So I feel like I learned so much more about this Good. event. Um, Thank you all for attending and all of your great questions. Yes. We'll be sending a follow-up email with a short survey that is anonymous, but I'd love all of your feedback on this type of program as we continue to plan more adult programs going forward. And I will share a recording of this talk this evening later this week. Wonderful. Thank you all for, for being here and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something and um, I had a great time talking. So thank you for the invite, Kristen. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank have a you. wonderful evening, everybody. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Have a great night, everyone.